Good evening, everyone. Glad you could all be here. We this is a um, this is our third fireside service that we've had here at Chilson Hills Church, and um, we really would have liked to have had this event outside in our beautiful memorial garden. Unfortunately, because of the weather being the way it is, uh, we didn't feel like we could risk it, and so. We're really glad that we have this facility and that we actually have the technology that we have to make it possible to still have this event with all of our players here tonight. So hopefully you are able to watch this on um, Facebook Live. We are going to be recording this and we're going to be posting it on our channel. So just wanted you to know that as well. Um, a couple of things is that we, like I said, this is our third fireside service. By the way, Pastor DJ Reed, I'm pastor of Chilson Hills Church. But this is our third one, and we are hoping to have other services in the future and continuing the, the topic of racial injustice and inequality. And so we wanted to um, uh, we want to see what your opinions are. So if you have ideas, um, we'd like to hear it. And you can post those ideas right there in the comment section um, here on in Facebook. Um, the other thing is this, is that we're going to have a, a question and answer time here um, later on after Buddy speaks. If you have questions that you would like to ask Buddy, if there is something that Buddy says that, um, you, that, just, that stirs or sparks a question, please put that in the comment section. Comment section, I'll be monitoring that, and then I will make sure that um, our moderator for the evening um, will uh, we'll take that and ask that to Buddy. We may not be able to get to all of those, um, but please make sure you let us know um, if you have those questions. Um, a couple other things. Um, oh, just to let you know, just our, um, the list of people that are going to be here. As I said before, um, Buddy Morehouse is going to be our, our main keynote speaker tonight. I'll give you his bio later on. But our moderator for the, uh, for the evening is going to be Nicole Matthews Creech, who is the current board president for the Livingston Diversity Council. Uh, and she is a, a wonderful resource uh, and community leader for our area. Last month, we also invited, uh, we had great reception for our, um, our conversation with Sheriff Mike Murphy and Reverend Christian Adams of Hartford Memorial Baptist Church in Detroit. And um, so we invited community leaders to talk about law and order last, last month. Um, and we have opened the door for other community leaders to speak and to be uh, to share their opinions, um, or their their thoughts, and their encouragements to us. And so, um, one of those leaders that um, I'd like to have share a word with us here today about about the conversation, the ongoing conversation of racial inequality and injustice here in our community, is um, is Representative Alyssa Alyssa Slotkin. Uh, of the 8th District, and so at this time, I'd like to invite her to come forward. Great. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm sorry that we can't be together. I know it's so much more fun and, um, and hopeful when we can be together, but I'm glad that we have figured out a way to somehow convene, even if we can't be in the same room. Um, as the representative for the 8th District, it has really been an amazing thing to go um, and just be a leader during this time. Um, since June, when the conversation on facing the issue of racial disparities, yes, thank you, thank you, um, and, um, and systemic racism um, has really been in the forefront of, of a lot of conversations. And um, I know that it's been quite an experience for me to be um, uh, going out and with the NAACP in Lansing, Michigan, doing peaceful rallies to the Capitol, um, hosting these large conversations about having an agenda um, to counter racial inequality, and then frankly watching our communities here in Livingston County, in Oakland County, in rural Ingham County, really grapple with, um, with this issue in a really honest um, and tough sometimes way. Um, and I know we're here in Brighton where I think we had over 200 folks who came out for a peaceful rally in support for racial justice. Um, we've had rallies across our community in, in Howell, in Oxford, in Lake Orion, in Holly, I participated in one. And 
um, I find them really inspiring because people in a way that I feel like is really different from what we've seen in the past want to have the conversation, want to convene um, and push themselves, which I think is the beginning of the conversation. Um, there are lots and lots of things that we can talk about um, on the agenda for racial equality, um, but none of them happen unless we agree that we need to have a conversation. And I think I've been really inspired by watching leaders do that. I thank the church here for, for holding these conversations, and I'm, I'm just privileged to be a part of them. So thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Representative Slack, and we just appreciate your leadership during this time. We appreciate all those who are making difficult decisions and contributing to this conversation that um, just when you think that it kind of hits a lull and there's people aren't as into it anymore, um, suddenly an event happens like what we are seeing in Kenosha right now, um, reminding us that it is um, that this conversation is always relevant and we need our leaders to step up and to not only encourage us like what was just done right now, but to also make those hard decisions, those tough calls and to, um, and to say the, the things that, maybe pe that may make people uncomfortable and the things that challenge as well. And so we're really grateful um, uh, for Representative Slotkin and for others who are helping with make this conversation and bringing it to the, our, our attention. Um, bef uh, before um, our speaker speaks tonight, you have just been hearing just a little bit, kind of like a little intro, um, from our, um, our good friend, Sherry Jackson Caldwell. And uh, Sherry has performed for us each of our fireside gatherings. Uh, she is undoubtedly the highlight of the evening every time that she has come. And uh, we are so grateful every time that she has, that she has come to be with us. Um, and I know that you will enjoy her too. And so I invite you to, if you are a person of faith, to allow her words to inspire you and to, um, and to transport you to a place where you can, you can experience um, the love of God. Um, and if you are not a person of faith, I pray and I hope that her music and her words will inspire you as well and will encourage you wherever you are in life. Jerry. Good evening. And praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, somebody. Praise the Lord because he's worthy to be praised. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the Lord is worthy to be praised. I get excited when I think about Jesus, and I'm just glad to be in the house of the Lord one more time. I just want you for a minute to forget about everything that's going on in the world and just put your mind on Jesus. Put your mind on God because he is worthy. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. And no matter what's going on in our lives, God is in control. He sits high and he looks low. And he knows all about our, our struggles and our troubles. He knows what kind of day we had today. And so we're just going to lift up the name of Jesus. I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice to worship you, oh, my soul. Join my King in what you hear, and let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. 
there's something about that name.
they could lift their hands and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. How many times we get in the car, we don't know if we're going to make it back, but he, he looks out for us. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Sometimes I look and it's a car I didn't even see, but thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I told you. I told you. Right. Thank you, Sherry. She's going to sing. She's going to sing one more time at the end. So, um, y'all, that hasn't last. That's not the last we'll hear of her. So glad to, so glad you could be here with us again, Sherry. I came here to Livingston County about 10 years ago. Uh, and, uh, when I came, when I was interviewing for this job, I was told, that um, I was told, the, well, really one of the first things that I was told about this county was that at one time the Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan of Michigan lived right here in this county in Cahokta. And one of the first things that, that was what I was told you know, by big people in this church. And then outside of the community, then people would still mention it. They would say, you know, at one time the Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan of Michigan used to live here in Livingston County. And but it's not like that anymore, and there was, it, it became clearly the event or the, uh, how do I say it, the, the characteristic that um, defined this county. Um, and, um, you know, I think as much as people, residents of this county, have tried to push back against it, it continues to be um, something that people recognize and bring up who are outside of this county. Uh, and as we can see now, those who are inside the county as well. Um, and, you know, I, I think um, we are quick to say that that doesn't happen anymore. But back in October of 2019, um, we came, uh, we had a group that was using our facility and they came to that front entrance. And there at the front entrance, they found, using bricks from our property, a large four foot by four foot swastika. Now, we can easily say that it doesn't happen here um, and we can say that it, uh, that, that, that happened back in the, that time, but, but if, but if we're honest, that, that the residual effects, whether it is the reputation, whether it is that story, or whether it is just the, how it, it affects um, the, those who are young and those who are old, and how it still kind of is a, a, even a little bit of a playful joke to some people, um, it's still here. And the, the person who, who covered the story of this, um, of, uh, uh, this, of Bob Miles and the Ku Klux Klan back in the 1980s is a man named Buddy Morehouse, and he will be our, um, our speaker for today. Buddy was an editor for the Livingston County Press and later for the Livingston County Daily Press in August from 1983 to 2009. And since then, he's been writing for the Livingston Post um, in his, uh, in the, um, he has uh, covered, uh, like I said before, he's covered in the, the 1980s and in the early 1990s, he covered the Ku Klux Klan, the, the Grand Dragon, Robert Miles, who I've talked about, and he's been writing about race and diversity and Livingston County's reputation for almost 40 years now. Uh, he is also, he, he's also a documentary filmmaker, and he currently works as a vice president of media and public relations for the Michigan Charter School Association. He and his wife, Kathy, have four children, and they live in Gregory. So I want to give Buddy as much time as possible, but I want to remind you, if you have questions or if you have comments that you'd like to make, please use that comment section here and right there in Facebook. Please make sure you, you put that there, and um, we'll make sure that that gets to him. So without further ado, Buddy, come on up.
Thank you very much, DJ. And I'm joined up here by Nicole as well. Thank you, Nicole. Good to see you. Good to see you. I am, I am not very happy about ha having to follow Sherry, though. That was amazing. <laughs> and for the for the five or six people who are here, can we give her a round of applause more? Thank you. That was absolutely incredible and inspirational. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with my friend. Uh, am I okay? I just haven't good? said anything yet. <laughs> okay. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. I thank my friend, Pastor DJ Reed, for inviting me to come tonight. Um, it is a pleasure. I thank Representative Slotkin for sharing her words and, and her leadership, and thank you for being here as well. Um, I'm going to just talk a little bit about Livingston County's reputation, how it came to be, uh, particularly Howell's reputation, because that's really what... Um, uh, what the effect of Bob Miles has, has been is sullying Howell's reputation. But I want to say at the very beginning that this whole thing that we're talking about tonight, this whole issue that we're talking about tonight, is a very touchy subject, and it always has been in Livingston County and in Howell. This is going back 40, 50 years or so. There are a lot of people who would prefer that we never, ever talk about Howell's reputation that we never talk about Bob Miles, that, we, that he died almost 30 years ago, that he has nothing to do with Livingston County now, and that we should never speak about him. I've written about him a lot in the newspaper and in the Livingston Post, and every time I do that, there are a lot of people who are uh, furious about it, who are not at all happy about it. And I know there's probably people who are um, watching today who would prefer that we not talk about this. Um, and a lot of people I really respect. Too. Um, but I just kind of want to let you know why I feel it's important that we need to talk about who he was and, and how Howell's reputation um, and Livingston County's reputation uh, came to be, the role that he played in that, and why I think it's so harmful. The one thing I think we can all agree on, and, and DJ hit on that, is that Howell, Livingston County in particular Howell, has a reputation it's really a twofold reputation that are kind of intertwined. We have a reputation of being a hotbed of racism and a place where racism is either accepted or is um, just a part of the fabric here. In particular, Howell has a reputation of being the home of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, and not even historical. A, a lot of people still think that there's an active Ku Klux Klan chapter in Howell that they hold, you know, meetings every Friday night and you're going to walk down the street and people see people in sheets and... Um, and crosses burning and things like that. Uh, so I want to say at the very beginning that there is no Ku Klux Klan in Howell. And in fact, there never has been a Ku Klux Klan in Howell. The guy who was the Grand Dragon of the Klan didn't even live in Howell. He lived in Cahokta Township, which is about 15 miles or so north of Howell. Um, but Howell has, has this reputation of being the home of the KKK. And it, it's not just something that is uh, upsetting to us, it's something that has actually been harmful in the community. Anybody who's ever lived in Howell, worked in Howell, spent any time there, can probably tell you a story about how that reputation has impacted them. Um, in my case, I, I lived in Howell back in 1983 when I first started at the newspaper, and uh, my best friend in college was a guy named Drew Sharp, who was a, um, he later became a, a sports writer for the Detroit Free Press, and, and he was pretty well known there. But um, Drew was my, my best friend in college. In 1984, we, we were both, went, we went to Michigan, we were big Michigan fans. In 1984, Michigan made the, the finals of the NIT basketball tournament, and it was going to be on ESPN. And Drew lived in Detroit, and back in the early 80s, believe it or not, there was no cable TV in Detroit. They didn't have cable TV. So I invited Drew out to come to, um, to watch the game with me in, in my place in Howell. And he was really nervous about coming out there because, you know, he'd heard this reputation. I'm going, Drew, you'll be fine. It's just, we're going to come. And so he came up. Everything was great and all that. But it, it really, that was kind of a personal um, experience in my mind where I saw this reputation is real and it's harmful. And um, just a few examples of how Howell's reputation has not just you know, been harmful in terms of a friend not wanting to come up and visit you. But um, these are just a few sort of recent ones. In 2012, there was a company um, in Howell called CEI -E Michigan. They were a sheet metal and roofing company, 
and they had gotten a contract to do some work in Detroit on a building in the Eastern Market. It was like a $126,000 contract. When the contract went before the Detroit City Council, they voted to cancel the contract strictly because of Howell's reputation. And they said this during the, during the council meeting. Uh, the council president at the time was Charles Pugh, and he was quoted as saying, this looks really bad. You can't have contracts coming from Howell, Michigan. This is just a company that's trying to do business in Detroit, and because of their reputation, the, the Detroit City Council voted to can cancel the contract. Uh, in 2017, August of 2017, uh, Brandon Dillon, who was the chairman of the Michigan Democratic Party, sent out a tweet where he was criticizing a woman named Lena Epstein who held a pro-Donald Trump um, rally at, at a place in Howell. He tweeted out that it was understandable she would want to do that because Howell was, quote, the home of the Michigan KKK. This is a former state representative and somebody who should, who should know better than to not, not uh, do, say something irresponsible like that. That caused a huge uproar, and the Howell Chamber of Commerce wrote him a letter and said, you know, you, you need to retract that. We're not the home of the KKK. Um, so those are just a couple examples of some, some tangible things of, of people being, I mean, literally harmed by Howell's reputation in there. In my mind, the reason that we need to talk about this, the reason we need to bring this out, is that we can't have a serious talk about race and diversity in Livingston County if we're constantly having to defend this unfair reputation that there is a Klan, that the, the Howell is the home of the KKK. We definitely need to have a serious conversation about race and diversity in Livingston County, but we need to get past the fact that this is the home of the KKK, because it's not. It's not. We certainly have problems we need to talk about here, but we are not the home of the KKK. Um, so I, but I wanted to talk a, a little bit about the history of how this came to be, because this reputation didn't just come out of thin air. Um, according to the Southern Poverty Law Center, which is the only organization I know that actually tracks this stuff, there's only one active Klan chapter in Michigan right now. You probably don't have a clue where that is. It's in Alpena. According to the Southern Poverty Law Center, there's a, a, a Klan organization in Alpena called the Pacific Coast Knights of the KKK. Um, that's the only one in Michigan. There is none in Howell or anywhere in Livingston County. Um, but nobody looks at Alpena as being a place that's not welcoming for, um, for minorities to go. Um, but Howell's reputation really came from, as DJ said, it all can be traced back to a man named Bob Miles, Robert Miles who lived here a long time ago and who has been dead for 28 years now. Um, and somebody who, unfortunately, I, I knew. So this is Robert Miles. This is what he looked like there. He had a white beard and he didn't look very friendly and he was not very friendly. So Robert Miles um, was from New York. He, he uh, grew up in New York, lived in New York, and he didn't move here until the early 1960s when he was in his uh, late 30s or early 40s. He worked in the insurance industry, and um, he had gotten a job in Michigan, and, and he, they transferred him here, and that's how he came to, to Michigan. And he actually did live in Howell for, uh, for a short while when he first moved here. It was about 1962 or 63 or so that he actually moved to, uh, to Howell. And um, he wasn't involved in any racist uh, activity. He started getting a little bit involved in the community. Uh, he was involved with the Livingston County Republican Party for a short while. He was the treasurer of the county party. And then in the, in the late 60s, he quit the Republican Party and he got involved with uh, George Wallace's campaign. Uh, George Wallace was the segregationist governor of Alabama who um, ran for president in 1968, and he left the Democratic Party, and he, he formed his own party called the American Independent Party. So Bob Miles became really involved with the American Independent Party, and he um, became like the county chair of George Wallace's campaign in 1968. Uh, he started, and I kind of pieced all this together in talking to people from Livingston County and looking at old newspaper articles from the 1960s, because I didn't come here uh, until 1983. So my personal knowledge of Bob Miles kind of began then. This is all just pieced together from the newspaper before that. 
Um, so in, in the late uh, 60s, he was really involved with George Wallace's presidential campaign. And then in 1969, he moved out, to, um, he moved out of Howell and he moved to a farm in Cahocta Township up on Byron Road. And there started to be a lot of rumors in the community at that time that Bob Miles was involved with the Klan, but he would never admit it. He would never confirm it or deny it or anything. But finally, in uh, February of 1970, he outed himself as a member of the Ku Klux Klan. There was a front page picture in the Livingston County Press of Bob Miles in a black Klan robe and this big story on there uh, about he, yeah, okay, yeah, I'm a Klansman. Um, he basically admitted everything, and at that time he'd been elected the Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to talk about is how the newspaper covered him in the 1970s when he first started getting involved in the Klan versus how we covered him in the, in the, starting in the mid-1980s when I, when I was one of the uh, editors of the newspaper. In the early 1970s, the newspaper treated him like he was just this like great community icon guy. They treated him like he The other thing that he did is he started his own church on his property called the Mountain Church of Jesus Christ. This made up church that he started there and he made himself the pastor of this church. So they all started referring to him in the newspaper as Pastor Bob Miles and would talk about his, um, his ministry that he had up there and his church he had up there. And they treated the Klan like, almost like it was like the Kiwanis Club. Um, I found this one thing I just wanted to read really quickly here because this just absolutely amazes me that um, the way they treated this. This was an item that was in the newspaper in May of 1970. It was a description. This was just in a kind of a community news and notes columns. It said, A fiery cross of the Ku Klux Klan burned brightly in a darkened field near Millington, north of Flint, last Saturday night, while a Howell resident, Robert Miles, Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan in Michigan, watched and other Klansmen hurled firebrands at the blazing upright and crossbar of the burning Christ, cross. It was all part of a peaceful gathering of the Ku Klux Klan on the farm of Caleb Smallwood, exalted Cyclops of the KKK in Tuscola County. The cross-burning episode followed a family gathering and the initiation of 33 new Klan members, their wives and children. The affair began with a picnic in the afternoon. About 15 Klan members attended. This is the Klan we're talking about here, and this is how they were, how they were um, featured in the newspaper at the time. It, it's absolutely incredible to me. The, the editor at that time, and she's not here to defend herself, but the editor at that time was a woman named Alice Gray, who was from Pinckney. And as near as I can tell, she had an infatuation with Bob Miles. And the way he was depicted in the newspaper back then reflected that. She once wrote a column in there about how she thought it was appalling that none of the local high schools had invited him to come and speak at their schools. The Klan Grand Dragon. She was upset about that. Um, so the way he was treated in the 1970s was much different than the way he was treated in the paper in the, in the 1980s. And I think that that really had a lot to do with then how the community perceived him. Um, but anyway, so, so Bob Miles joins the Klan and in, in outs himself in 1970. And then in 1971, he decides he wants to spend some time in prison. So he starts to commit some felonies. This, is, this really lets you know what kind of person he was. Um, in April 1st of 1971, Miles participated in the tarring and feathering of a high school principal from Willow Run High School in Ypsilanti. It was a guy named Wiley Brownlee. He had just taken over Willow Run High School a few months before that, and there were some terrible racial problems at the school that, that Wiley Brownlee was trying to deal with. And one of the things that he had suggested was, what, was that they have a, a day at the school where they would honor Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, there. And after that happened, Bob Miles and five other Klansmen followed him after a school board meeting. They followed him down this road. One of the cars pulled in front of him and pulled in front so he and blocked his car. The other car got behind him so he couldn't go anywhere. They went, they dragged him out of the car, pulled him out of the car, they poured hot tar on his body and put feathers on him. And Bob Miles was one of the people doing this. I always tell that story to anyone who says that he was a harmless racist, that he just said evil things. Bob Miles was an evil, evil man. He not only said evil things, he did evil things. Um, a couple months later, in August, 
of 1971, he participated in the bombing of some empty school buses in Pontiac. They were just getting ready to start uh, integrated busing in the school district, and um, they wanted to terrorize the community, so Miles and, and four other people participated in the bombing of some school buses in Pontiac. Uh, he was charged with both of those crimes, and they finally went to trial in 1973, and he received a nine-year sentence. And he ended up serving six years of that nine-year sentence. So from 1973 to 1979, Bob Miles was in federal prison. Uh, at the time he was in prison and before that, he wasn't really a national white supremacist figure. He was really only known in Michigan and in Livingston County. So when he got out of prison in 1979, he started hosting these big rallies, these big Klan rallies on his property and cross burnings and everything. And that's really when his national um, profile started to become a huge thing among um, the white supremacist movement there. Um, I came to the newspaper in 1983 as, as uh, the sports editor, and after about three years, I became the editor of the paper. And it was in the mid-1980s that um, the two editors were myself and a guy named Dennis Keenan, who was my mentor. He was the managing editor of the newspaper at the time. We really made the conscious decision at that time that we were going to treat Bob Miles differently, that we were, number one, we were going to start covering him and his activities because we felt that it was important the community knew what he did. And number two, we were going to start editorializing about what a horrible person he was and how harmful what he was was doing and how it was harming the community. And Bob Miles didn't like that because he was used to the local newspaper being fawning and you know treating him like a, uh, a local hero. So he was not happy about that. Um, the, the biggest thing that happened, that, and this really is where the, the community started to be split and divided about how we should cover him was in uh, October of 1985. He came to the newspaper and he told us that he was going that weekend he was going to be having this big cross burning and rally at his property where he was going to invite hundreds of white supremacists from all over the country to be there. And he invited us if we wanted to send a couple reporters to cover this event. So we said, yeah, we were going to do it. Uh, in the past, they might have ignored it, done whatever. We decided we were going to do it. So we sent two reporters there who covered it. And that week on the front page of the newspaper, of the Livingston County Press, the Howell newspaper, was a big picture of a burning cross. And then two stories about this rally. And it just set off a firestorm in the community. People were, uh, there were some people who thought it was good that we were doing this, but oh my gosh, the, the reaction, the negative reaction that we got from people saying, why in the world are you covering this? Why are you giving this man attention? Why are you doing this? Why would you put a burning cross on the front page of the newspaper? Um, that reaction, that was 35 years ago, that reaction is still continuing today. Every time I write about Bob Miles or anyone else does, we get that same kind of reaction uh, from people. Um, but that, that really kind of set in motion how we were going to be covering him and dealing with him at the newspaper at that time. Um, the next big event that happened and the, the event that led to the formation of a group called Livingston 2001, which became the Livingston Diversity Council, was in September of 1988. And this is something Miles actually didn't have anything to do with directly. And in September of 1988, a cross was burned on the front lawn of a Howell family. Um, in particular, this woman named Shirley Griffin, an African-American woman who had grown up in Howell. She'd gone to Howell High School, had grown up in Howell. These two local idiots decided one night that they were going to burn a cross on the front lawn of her house. And, uh, and Miles and, and everyone pretty much um, confirmed this. He had absolutely nothing to do with this. These weren't members of his organization. They were just two guys that did this on their own. Um, but this, that event really finally was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back for Livingston County as a community. They finally realized we need to do something, A, with this, this, this uh, activity that's happening in Livingston County, and number two, we need to finally confront and deal with the whole issue of racism and diversity in Livingston County. So they started this group called Livingston 2001, and they got the name of the group uh, from the fact that the kids who were entering kindergarten that year in 1988 would be graduating from high school in the year 2001. So their idea was that by the time they graduated from high school, Livingston County would be a different place, a more welcoming place by that, by that time. That didn't happen. Um, 
so uh, what happened right after that was, was pretty remarkable. Was in, so that was 1988. February of 1989, the Michigan Civil Rights Commission decided that they were going to come to Howell and hold their monthly meeting in Howell uh, for a couple reasons. Number one, because they wanted to hear from the local community. And number two, because they wanted to show their support for Livingston 2001. So this was a public meeting where there's a call to the public at the beginning of the meeting. And at this meeting, I, I went to the meeting, um, I remember it very, very well. At this meeting, Bob Miles attended the, um, this meeting and he spoke at the beginning. He spoke during call to the public. He gave this angry, fiery five-minute speech during the, the call to the public where he basically called everybody in Livingston County hypocritical. What his message was is, you're all hypocrites because you love the fact that I'm here. You love the fact that I have this boogeyman reputation that I have here because you all love the fact that this is a mostly all-white community. It's because of me that I'm keeping it this way. So you can have all the meetings you want, whatever you want to, but you're all hypocrites. You should be thanking me. He even suggested that the real estate agents should give him some kind of an award and thank him for what he was doing. It's absolutely incredible. They did that. To my knowledge, that's the only time I can ever remember him speaking in public at any meeting. He wrote tons of letters to the editor and things like that. It's the only time I can ever remember him actually speaking, and that was the message that he gave. Um, in the, the, it was a couple years later, a, a documentary was released called Blood in the Face. It was a documentary that was actually shot in 1988 on his farm. He had invited a group of documentary filmmakers, including Michael Moore, this was like the first film that Michael Moore worked on, the first big film that he worked on. He had invited them out to a rally at his, um, uh, at his farm. They were going to have like two or 300 people there. And they filmed this documentary. They were totally open. They didn't stop them from going anywhere or talking to anyone. They filmed this documentary. It was called Blood in the Face. And it, it finally came out in 1991. The movie is on YouTube. I encourage you, if you want to know what he was really like, to watch that, that, that film because it is absolutely chilling. But that's the first time that really he was kind of introduced to the entire country in that public of a forum, and everybody got to see what was going on on his farm and what he was really like. Um, so Bob Miles died on August 16, 1992. It was apparently a heart attack, but he, he finally died. And at the time, I went back and to remind myself to look at some newspaper articles. At the time, a lot of people thought that, or they were expressing the hope that now that Bob Miles was dead, Howell and Livingston County can finally shed this reputation. We don't have to worry anymore about Bob Miles. He's dead. Now we can move on. We don't have to deal with that reputation. Well, that's been 28 years, and I think we know now that that reputation did not uh, die. The last thing that I want to talk about um, before Nicole and I start, start having a conversation here is um, in, in May of 2005, so this is, what, 13 years after Bob Miles died. There was this auction house in Howell, and they held an auction of all of Bob Miles' personal effects, including all of his old clan robes and stuff. His family had held on to everything, and they were finally going to have this big auction. It was, it was horrible. This was in Howell. They're, they're putting, like, clan robes in the front window of this auction house to show people what's going to be auctioned off. This got attention from all over the country, people coming in all over the place to, to cover this. So um, I, I was an editor uh, at the newspaper that time in May 2005, and one of our reporters, um, a woman named Susan Demas, she went down there and was doing a story on this auction, and she, I remember she came back to the office and she said, one of the things in the, in the auction is this award with your name on it. They said, what? And she said, yeah, there's some award that apparently the Klan gave you back in the 1980s, and it's one of the things that they're auctioning off. And then I remembered that, yeah, in, it, was, it was in 1989, Miles used to, he, he, used to every, he used to come in the newspaper all the time after we wrote about him, and he'd always ask to, to talk to me. And I would go up there, and he'd say some snarky things, and we'd you know, have a conversation. 
Um, so I, I had, you know, maybe a dozen conversations with him through the years, and he would write me letters all the time He'd, uh, about stuff that we'd written in the paper, stuff that was going on. And I forgot about it, but in 1989, he'd written me a letter and said, I just want to let you know that at our, um, at our meeting that we had, we had this big Klan convention in Grand Rapids last weekend, we gave you and Dennis Keenan an award. And I didn't know what it was. I hadn't thought about it. And I totally forgot about it until that time in 2005 when Susan Demas said, there's this Klan award with your name on it in there. So I went down and looked at it. And here is, I got a kind of a bad copy. This is the award. It's a, this is a bad picture off, a TV, or off of a computer screen of the Klan award that I got in 1989. But this is what it said on the award. It says, whereas by consent of the state council of this order, sitting in session at secret conclave in Grand Rapids, Michigan, Friday, October the 6th of the year of 1989, it is hereby proclaimed that the editor and his minions serving him on the Livingston County Press have done outstanding service to the white race through the racial agitation which their newspaper continuously promotes. And whereas these efforts are aimed at keeping Livingston a white island in a growing black sea, we here and now do award Buddy Morehouse, the Order of the Torn Bedsheet, with invisible garter attached. Dennis Keenan, the Order of the Ripped Pillowcase with Eye Holes Rampant. Sundry Minions of likewise, uh, of above likewise to be honored. Let these awards be published in public places as our tokens of appreciation for the services performed by above. I cannot tell you how much it chilled me to see my name on a piece of paper that was from the Ku Klux Klan. I will never, ever forget that. And then that went in the auction. Somebody told me I should go and, and buy that and, and you know, burn it up. I said, I don't want to give that family a dime. So somebody bought that and paid 5 or $10 for it, whatever, and I hope they burned it up. Um, but the point that Miles was making in there, and he might have been right, is that he felt that by continually reminding people that he existed, we were helping him to do his work by helping keep Livingston County the, the white bastion that, that it was. And I still struggle with that today. I don't know if we took the right approach back then. I don't know if I'm taking the right approach right now. There are people that agree with me. There are people who disagree with me that think that we should ignore him, forget our history, forget all that stuff. Uh, and other people think we need to address it and let them know that he is dead and that while we ha have problems to deal with, being a Klan hotbed is not one of them. So um, anyway, I, I guess I'll kind of open it up now. I've been talking for a long time and um, just kind of see what questions you have or other follow-up things. I yeah, recall. absolutely, thank absolutely. Um, Buddy, thank you so much for sharing the story and for doing the service work that you've done for the community in covering the story and continually covering the story even after um, his death. Um, and I, I think what's, what's incredible to me is your dedication to the, to the cause, to the topic, to the issue at hand. And um, in 2017, right, you wrote an article, um, Death of a Klansman, and it, it was at the 25th anniversary of Bob Miles' death. Um, I'm kind of talking about um, it had he had been dead for 25 years. And so, you know, kind of the point of that article is, he's gone, can we let go of this? It's no longer our history, it's no longer our legacy. Um, what, can you talk a little bit about what your hope was in writing that article? It really was, my, my hope in writing that was kind of, it, it all had to deal with the fact that I thought there were a lot of very serious things that we needed to talk about in Livingston County, serious issues we needed to talk about, but this whole clan reputation thing was gonna get in the way of that happening. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I thought that, um, you know, other communities have problems with race that they're able to at least talk about and deal with without having to deal with a, that, that reputation thing. So I just kind of wanted to remind people of, number one, how did this reputation come to be? Mm -hmm. We didn't just, people just didn't decide out of the blue that, okay, how we're going to decide that you're a racist community. That there was some, you know, foundation to that. And uh, really I wanted to kind of start the conversation going on how we can move forward and what we can do from there. Um, and like I said, there's a lot of people that were very upset with that article. There are people that think that by me 
continuing to stress the fact that Bob Miles is dead, that I'm saying that racism is dead in Livingston County. Mm -hmm. And that is not at all mm -hmm. what I was trying to say. Um, that's usually the complaint that I get when we, we um, repost that article every so often. And, and mm -hmm. you, we always get a, a very spirited reaction every time we do that at the Livingston Post. That's a nice um, word, spirited. It's very yeah, it's a nice word. Very spirited, yeah. <laughs> um, but So I don't want anyone to think, and I keep saying this, that I'm not saying that we don't have problems that we need to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, and that seems to be the, the, the conclusion that they reached that I was trying to get across when I wrote that. And that's not it at all. It right. was saying we need to put that aside so we can right. really deal with the problem. Right, right, right. And that, that really leads into my next question for you. Um, so how did the context and or the acts of racism change in Livingston County from the time that Robert Miles was alive to the time that you wrote that article? Like what was that landscape and how did that change contextually? We continued to have, um, uh, there continued to be issues that pop up and DJ referenced the story. He actually mm -hmm. told me that a little while ago of the whoever it was who left a swastika on the, made out of bricks on the, mm -hmm. on the steps of the church here. There continue to be uh, incidents like this that happen in Livingston County, thing, things like that. They tend, because they happen in Livingston County, especially if they happen in Howell, they tend to get publicized a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, that um, is just kind of, a, I guess, a natural byproduct of our, of our reputation. Um, there was a, the thing that happened earlier this year where there was a woman who tweeted, it was in the wake of the George Floyd murder, Somebody had tweeted that um, Howell should be the first city in Michigan to burn. Right. And uh, that caused, of course, an enormous uproar in the community. Um, she was a state employee. She eventually was suspended from her job, and she still is facing the possibility of criminal prosecution over that. Mm -hmm. It was a huge issue in our prosecutor's race, the primary that we had this, this summer. And um, when, they, when the news came out to cover that, and the, 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 I think it was Channel 2 is the one that I saw, they, of course, they put all this stock footage on there of clan cross burnings and clan people and everything like right. that because it involved right. Howell. That's just kind of how we, um, how we are now. But there have been several incidents that have happened uh, through the years. There was a, right. a, um, a student at Howell High School who tweeted a white power tweet after they played an, an African-American basketball team. That got a lot of coverage. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we continue to have these incidents. The one, I guess maybe positive thing that comes out of that is that they are not when when something like like that happens if it's publicized i don't think people let it go i think we're to a point now mm -hmm. where the backlash that comes when something like that is publicized is it, it's it's refreshing to see that i don't know if we would have had that necessarily in the past mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. but certainly we you know continue to see those kinds of those kind of incidents, uh, you know, pop up. I don't know if it's any more than in any other community, but you know, we—it's it, not like when he died that that racism disappeared in Livingston County. Sure, sure. That didn't happen. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know, and I've, I've been watching a couple. I've been watching a, a series who uh, that features W. Kamau Bell on CNN, and it's called United Shades of America. And it's, uh, it's really interesting. He actually uh, interacts with the KKK. He talks with various communities, and it's not just focused on the African-American community. Um, it's to help us learn about other cultures that make up America and uh, becoming the United Shades. And he talks about the last, actually the most recent episode that I watched, he talked about the fact that we see all of the things um, in the news that talk about these, these um, horrible incidences that are happening, right? The, the murder and the wrongful shooting of black lives and the actions of the KKK even, even now and, and historically, and we see those things, but where racism comes down to a lot of times is it's, it's under the iceberg, right? We see the tip of the iceberg and what's underneath that water is all of those kind of ra racial epithets, the racial comments, the racist jokes, the microaggressions that are you know, kind of given to um, folks or, or shared with folks that, that most of us don't really know how to respond to. Um, and I think you're right, this energy that we have has been really capitalized on, and I hope we continue to capitalize on that, right? Right. Um, I, I want to go back a few years. So in 2011, you partnered, um, you co-wrote and co-directed Black and Blue with Brian, with Brian Kruger. And mis uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you guys have collaborated on a couple of 
different right. things, right? Okay. So, so Black and Blue was a film that featured the story of Gerald Ford and Willis Ward at U of M. Um, and uh, can you tell us a little bit about the film um, and why you chose to tell the story? Sure. Um, yeah, Black and Blue is a story about an incident that happened at the University of Michigan back in 1934. Um, back then, Michigan's football team was all white, and they uh, had an African-American player named Willis Ward, who was mm -hmm. the first um, African-American player they'd had in, in more than 30 years on the team there. And that year, they were supposed to play uh, Georgia Tech, uh, a team from the South. And the custom back then, the Jim Crow custom back then, every time a team from the North would play a team from the South, um, is that if the team from the North had an African-American player on the team, they would have to sit that player, mm. or the team from the South would refuse to play them. So when Georgia Tech came to Ann Arbor to play um, Michigan in 1934, they insisted that Willis Ward be benched for the game. And Michigan's athletic director at the time, Fielding Yost, um, who had his own racist past, he agreed to bench Willis Ward from that game. Mm -hmm. That infuriated his teammates, particularly his best friend on the team, who was a guy named Gerald Ford. Mm -hmm. And so the story of Black and Blue, we came across uh, about 10 years ago or so. Um, it, it was this incredible, amazing story about the, not only what happened to Willis Ward, but the friendship between these two people. Um, this white kid from Grand Rapids and this black kid from Detroit, the friendship that they formed. And when, when that incident happened, Gerald Ford went to the coach and he told him he was going to quit the team if they mm -hmm. didn't do it. He only played the game because Willis Ward asked him to and he told him that he, that he had to play the game and he had to play it for him on there. So we came across the story and as we got into it, as we got into making the film, we found all these other layers um, to the story and it was just... Um, amazing the response that we got after we mm -hmm. we did that and the discussion that it spurred we, we sh we've shown that it's been out well, i guess almost nine years now right. um and we've shown that film all over the country now it's been on tv um several times and one of the best showings that we ever had of that film was at howell high school that we had i think it was in 2012 mm -hmm. um we had several hundred people who came there to watch that film and just the conversation that we had afterward and the messages and everything came out of that were just, uh, it, it, it's the kind of film when you see it and the kind of story when you see it, it'll really get you thinking and talking about a lot of things. Right. So that's really why we wanted to make that, that story. It, it also, mm -hmm. Willis Ward's a man I never met and he's one of my heroes. When you, when you see what he went through and what he, uh, what he endured there and then the life that he lived after that was absolutely incredible. And Gerald Ford is, he's my favorite president. He might not be our greatest president, but he's my favorite president. The character that he showed back then as a, you know, 20 year old guy that no one was paying attention to was just inspirational. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. so that's the, kind of the story of why we decided to make that. Some two good, two good guys, two good yes. guys. And, and so, you know, I got to be a part of that screening at Howell High School and, and it was, it was really amazing. And, you know, thinking about this event tonight and, and being virtual and having a very limited audience and going back nine years and thinking there were several hundred of us in this <laughs> auditorium and I really miss those days. So I we need too. to figure this stuff out so this stops happening. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> I really miss those days. Um, but, one of the other really amazing things that came out of it, I think, too, is, is where we have those events, these local heroes, these like unsung heroes, these, these people that we would never have imagined could do some incredible things, do incredible things. And one of those people was a little young girl mm -hmm. named Jenna Urbane, and, and it's, okay, eight years ago. And I haven't thought about her for probably a good couple years, and we were preparing for this, and immediately her name popped in my head she left a huge impression on me. Tell us a little bit about what Jenna did. So Jenna back then was a second grader from Brighton. Mm -hmm. Jenna had seen the documentary with her mom. And um, when, when you, when you kind of get into the story and you see how Willis Ward's whole story was kind of lost to history, she got done watching the movie and she was talking to her mom and she said, um, they were talking about how, how wrong it was what happened to Willis Ward. And then mm -hmm. she said, um, has anybody done anything to, you know, honor him or is there a building named after him or anything like that and her mom said no i don't think so she said well i think that somebody needs to do that <laughs> and her mom said well yes you're right why don't you do that 
And Jenna Urbane's a second grader, right. a second grader. Well, her mom worked in Lansing, and she kind of knew her way a little bit around the system. Mm -hmm. So she said, if you want to, I will take you to Lansing. We will go around, and you can talk to people, and you can tell them the story about why they need to honor Willis Ward. So Jenna, a second grader from Brighton, prepared all this material about Willis Ward. And she went, and she went through the state senate, and she went and talked to almost every senator and told them why there needed to be a Willis Ward Day in mm -hmm. the state of Michigan. She did that. She got a senator from Kalamazoo who agreed to sponsor the resolution, and the, the Michigan State Senate unanimously voted that October 20th, 2012, which is the anniversary of the, the Georgia Tech game, mm -hmm. that that should be Willis Ward Day in the state of Michigan. Then she went to the University of Michigan Board of Regents, mm -hmm. again, as a second grader. She went to the University of Michigan Board of Regents and told them that they needed to do something on the Michigan campus to honor Willis Ward. Mm -hmm. And they did. There is now a room at the Michigan Union called the Willis Ward Lounge, this beautiful lounge in there. That ha and it has a little you know, plaque in there that describes the whole thing and all that. And that's only because that second grader from Brighton took it upon herself to go and do that, to lobby the state senate and to lobby the Michigan Board of Regents that they need to honor Willis Ward. So Jenna now is a, a junior in high oh school. Oh, gosh. Yes, it's been a while. <laughs> She's a junior in high school now, but I think she really showed that it doesn't matter how old you are, you can make a difference mm -hmm. in there. So, yeah, she... Mm -hmm. She was inspiring to us back then. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's, that's like I said, it's, this is the, these are the times when, when people just kind of step out of their comfort zone and do something to do what's right, right? And, and the energy in the last couple of months feels good. It feels really, really good. Um, but I also think um, as we're going through what's happening in our world and we're focused on, you know, recently what's most recently what's happened in, in Kenosha, Wisconsin um, with Jacob Blake, we need to recognize those those microaggressions and, and the the very real racism that still happens and still affects our Livingston County community. Um, and I think, you know, where we struggle, I think a lot of times as as a very overwhelmingly white community is where is our place? How do we define our place? Where do we, how do we begin to legitimately be a part of the solution, right? Um, how do we address it and how do we help support um, our neighbors of color that live in our community? Because we still have these issues of racism here. Um, you know, from things like the Howell tweets um, that you brought up a few, uh, a few minutes ago um, after a basketball game. Um, we had a couple years ago, we had uh, a car and a, and a couple of homes sprayed painted with some racial slurs. Um, fortunately, you know, we reached out to some really, really great folks in the community and uh, a couple body shops and, and house painters and they took care of it at no cost um, to us. It was something that the Diversity Council wanted to sponsor and they said, nope, we got it. And I said, well, thank goodness, because I don't have a lot of money. So, um, <laughs> so, and again, the community pulls together. So. Um, but we need to recognize that these things are still happening and just because there isn't bloodshed doesn't mean that it's any less harmful, any less damaging than the things that are happening across the country. Um, so I had reached out to a couple of folks who, who live in Livingston County and kind of asked for stories. If there was a story that they had that they, could, that they wanted to share um, about their experience, because I don't, I don't live this experience, right? And, and so I think we can only do what we can do when we know the experience or when we hear the experience of other folks. So I wanted to share a brief story um, of something that happened just a couple months ago. Um, and so this is from uh, the person who shared the story with me. I never fully relax in what has become known as white spaces, which for me is practically everywhere, given where I work in the community which I reside. It's the same for every black American. You can't afford to, dro you can't afford to drop your guard, else you risk yourself emotionally, professionally, and sometimes physically. A white man followed me home once. I was about three miles from my house at the intersection of Spencer and Old 23. I noticed a small pickup behind me. It was just past dusk, and I had the feeling that this vehicle had been behind me for quite some time. So I made a point of driving past my street and driving randomly around the neighborhood. He followed, matching even the slightest change in speed. Sure that he was following me, I sped up. He gave chase. 
We kept at this for a good five minutes before I decided to bring things to a head. Don't ask me why. I just had enough. So I stopped at a three-way intersection and waited. Even rolled down my window, waved him around. He sat for a good three minutes before he bumped my vehicle from behind and reversed course. And now the chase was on in reverse. I followed him for about two miles until we returned to, to where I first noticed him. He turned north on old US 23 and I headed south to the old Michigan State Police Post just down the road where I made my report. I provided the plate number and the description of the vehicle, but I, couldn't, and, but I could not identify the driver in a subsequent photo lineup. It was dark and he appeared to have altered his appearance for the picture. The state police wouldn't tell me why, but they were sure that it was racially motivated. But they didn't have to tell me. I've run into his kind before, who take it upon themselves when they decide that I don't belong. For a while, we ran into each other socially. He was a friend of a friend. He never appeared to acknowledge our shared experience, and for the sake of my friend, I never called him out on it. I wish I had. So these are the experiences, and, and, and we hear the experiences that are happening across the country with law enforcement um, following folks, um, questioning them for driving while black, and, and we now have everyday citizens that are questioning folks for driving while black. And, and so this is, this is the reality. And so, you know, as, as much as, as there are these jaw-dropping events that are happening outside of our community, <coughs> everything that happens within our community should be just as jaw-dropping, right? Um, and you talk a lot about um, people wanting to get over this, right? Getting, getting past our past. Um, and I think that's where we really struggle, of trying to figure out how do you move past that? And is it that you, you say, this isn't us anymore and we need to move forward? There ne does there need to be some acknowledgement? Does there need to be some um, history that, that is, is stated, right? Um, there's the concept of the removal of statues that I, I kind of go back to, right? And there's, there's battles on both sides of you need to remove that because it, it's, it's uh, celebrating our history. Um, and then some people say you have to leave it because it reminds our history so we don't have to repeat or we don't repeat it. And so I think that's where we, where we fail to move forward is what is our next step? Um, so I guess my first question is, do you think, after covering these kinds of issues for the last 30 plus years, almost 40 years, I wasn't sure how much I should date you. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh yeah, no. I, you know, I don't necessarily want to date myself, but as you're talking <laughs> about miles and things, I was like, you know, I wasn't around then. Um, <laughs> and I wasn't oh quite yeah. here yet. So, um, but a long, long time, right? Has, has, it's been a really big portion of your, of your life and your work. And so in that time, do you think that our community in Livingston County is ready for a change? Do you think we truly value diversity and equity and equality and inclusion and all of those things that will help us to move forward? Some people probably do and a lot of people probably don't. Um, I guess is the easy answer there, and I don't. I certainly don't have a lot of answers on, on this one here. I can only speak from my, my perspective and my mm -hmm. experience um, on all this. But uh, I, I think that one of the things that, um, one of the evolutions that we've seen through the years is this willingness to finally, um, finally acknowledge our reputation and our past, mm -hmm. and uh, hopefully define what the what the real issues should be in that in that conversation. Mm -hmm. in there. That, that's mm -hmm. one of the things I have tried to at least offer an opinion on mm -hmm. um, in that. A lot of people don't agree with me on it, but um, I, I feel that we've at least as a community been more willing to, uh, to address this than we were 40 years ago mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. or to talk about it than we were 40 years ago. And then every time something comes up, every time an incident comes up or something um, else you know, comes to light, then we need to talk about that again and what we can, what we can do. Mm -hmm. But I don't know as, as a community if, we, um, if we're any more ready to deal with this than, than we ever were, but 
we're at least having the conversations, whereas mm -hmm. that didn't necessarily happen in the past. Right, right. So then my next question makes it, is even all that more hard, right? Okay. So, so how do we move forward when we have maybe a portion of the population that's ready to move forward? Um, you know, we talk a lot about um, addressing racism, addressing oppression, just even in, in general. Um, and we see racism and oppression at, at all levels. We see it at the individual level. We see it at the interpersonal level. We see it at the um, community level. And we certainly see it at the institutional level, right? And, and our, our, I think just as an, an exa as an example, our law enforcement is only as good as its policies allow it to be, right? That sometimes we get stuck in, in our policies and protocols and, and procedures um, and, and ceilings of the things that we can do and the things that we can't. Um, so I guess, you know, how do we, how do we as business owners, as educational institutions, places of worship, right? We're in the church, um, it's a good first step. Nonprofit organizations, social communities, how do we move past our history in a purposeful and meaningful way? And how do we, how do we show that, and I, sh and show, I wish I could like say this is in big bold letters, right? Show, how do we show, we don't just say, how do we show that we've changed, that we're different? Because I think we can always say we're different but how do we show that? I think my feeling is that one of the biggest problems that we have here is that minorities don't feel welcome mm -hmm. in Livingston County. Mm -hmm. um, they feel afraid to come here. They feel that uh, for whether it's justified or not, they, they, we, we don't have a, um, a welcoming and inclusive reputation. Mm -hmm. So there are people where they hear about, hey, you want to go to the outlet mall in Howell? Do you want to go to dinner in Howell? I'm having, I live in Howell. I'm having a party this uh, Saturday night. Can you come? That, depending on who you are, you could get different reactions mm -hmm. on that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so so we, that's, what, that's one thing that we need to deal with is we need to, um, whatever it takes, we need to change that, whether it's, it's part of it's changing the reputation by by telling people that there's no clan here and part of it is by letting by changing the environment in the county so that everybody does feel welcome mm -hmm. nobody should it should you shouldn't think twice about i want to i heard this there's this great restaurant in downtown howell i want to go there i'm you know i'm an african-american couple i want to go to that restaurant you should think twice about doing that you shouldn't think twice about going to the outlet mall or shopping in howell but unfortunately that's not the that's not the case you shouldn't mm -hmm. think twice about taking a job in howell you mm -hmm. shouldn't think twice about doing business with someone uh, from Livingston County, but but we're not to that that point yet. We need to get mm -hmm. there, and so just one quick story that I'll tell is is mm -hmm. that part of it. I, I don't think we can change the whole world, but uh, you know, it, yes, it, we it, can. At one time, <laughs> we change at one one heart and one mind at a time. Right. And right. one. So I think you ask what what can we do as mm -hmm. business leaders, as as you know, as community members, as churches, as educational organizations. I think we can form relationships with people who are not from Livingston County, understand what they're feeling and where they're coming from, mm -hmm. invite them here mm -hmm. to see and experience it. And I'll I'll tell you a quick story along those lines. Um, one of the things I, d I do at the Living Supposed, so this is just kind of a fun job that I, you know, that I have, mm -hmm. I write for them on occasion, is um, I'm really involved with the Community Theater of Howell. My family's okay. been really involved with them for a long time. I met my wife through that group. I love the Community Theater of Howell. So one of the things that I do is every time they have a big musical or a show, I'll write these feature stories on people that are, that are in the cast mm -hmm. to help, you know, drum up publicity for the show. Last fall, they were doing the musical Annie. And okay. um, the woman who was playing the part of Miss Hannigan, the mean owner of the orphanage, um, was this African-American woman who lived in Lansing. So I, you know, I s like sent out questions to all the people in the cast and everything. You know, how did you get involved in the group? And she asked me if I could call her on the phone because she wanted to talk about something. Usually I just email the questions and they send them back. So I called her up and she told me the story. She said, um, you know, I'm, a, I'm an African-American woman. I'm... I live in Lansing, and it was actually a couple of years ago, this woman I worked with invited me to, um, to come, and she knew I liked doing theater. She invited me to come and try out for this show that they were having. And when I found out it was Howell, I said, I don't want to, I don't know. I, I just did it. She goes, really? This, no, it's a really nice group. She goes, oh, all right. So she came there. She was in this show, and she said, 
that experience just changed my perception and changed everything I ever thought about Howell. Mm -hmm. And these, if you know anyone in the community theater Howell, they are just the nicest people in the world. Um, she said, this is like my second family now. I came and met mm -hmm. all these people and it just changed my heart to personally experience and, and to know that. I'm going, boy, if we could, so, so she just wanted me to know that. And she said, do you think it'd be mm -hmm. okay if I talked about that in the article? I said, sure, that's a fantastic perspective to have and to get out there. So if there's some way that we can, on, on each of us in our own way, you know, to help foster that, that relationship mm -hmm. uh, with people from outside Livingston County, mm -hmm. I think that's how we can really help to improve the situation. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure when she went to the community theater Howell, it wasn't just her learning about what Howell was like, it was the people at Howell learning what she was like and what mm -hmm. her you know, thoughts and fears and perceptions were and everything, and they learned a lot. And you know, how does she feel? Because I'm, you know, I'm a white guy, I cannot put myself in the, in the shoes of uh, somebody who's a, who's a minority in this community. I can't begin to relate to what they go through mm -hmm. on there. So uh, that, that two-way street, I think, is so important. But mm -hmm. we, we have to knock down those walls and do that. Right, right. Now, that's, that's a, a really great um, perspective. And I think, you know, it's, it's true. We, again, struggle with how do you address it's so big. I think that's, that's where I get stuck. It's so big. <laughs> And, and so we start with those kind of interpersonal relationships, those interpersonal conversations, um, you know, reaching out to a little bit beyond that community, seeing who's already here. And, and I have, you know, the, the great thing is, is that I've had positive stories from, from people who have had great experiences in, in Livingston County and specifically in Howell. Um, and, uh, and, and maybe, you know, maybe we get back to um, an idea that DJ had. And, uh, and it's about storytelling, right? Storytelling, and people love listening to stories. Um, it helps us to kind of fill that gap of, I, I'm a white female. I have no idea how this might affect a black female. I don't know how this is going to affect um, a, a, a white male. Um, we're all gonna have those kind of different exposures and different experiences. And so storytelling is one of those ways where we can, we can kind of feel in or feel with that person. Um, obviously, I'm never gonna understand completely that experience and, and be able to know exactly how that feels. Um, but I think that's where where we can feel, I'm gonna be corny, where we can all feel human, right? There's, there's some commonalities, right. we're all human, right? And it's not so simple, and I get that. Um, but, but there are things that make us all human, and, and there's that human component that that storytelling, I think, can really bring us together. So you ask DJ, you ask people to kind of share comments and share ideas about what's next. I think that's what's next. I don't know. That's my thought. <laughs> and you and you learn when you hear stories. You learn things mm -hmm. too. That's Absolutely. I love that too. Yeah, yeah. So I'm wondering if uh, if those are all the prepared questions I had, and I, I really appreciate it. I um, have it's been well, a I've long time this. since mm -hmm. we've chatted, yes, so it's it nice to reconnect. <laughs> um, and I think I I don't know if uh, if we have some things yeah, to can share. You, okay. Can you guys, can, is this on? Is this on? Check, check. Good, good. Okay. So just a few. One of them was just kind of more of a comment at the beginning. And one of them was more like, listen, why are we talking about this? It sounds like we're making excuses um, instead of taking action for change. So right. um, do I need to, am I, am I not getting it? Oh, I need to move in. I'm out of the frame. I'm really not that camera friendly. <laughs> We want to see a DJ. The bald head is given a glare, right? <laughs> so um, I know, but I'm getting in front of, of, let me get over here. Come over in the middle. There you go. Yeah, because I'm in front of Nicole. There, you go. there we go. Good. So um, about this whole, about, can you see how sometimes when we say things like, you know, like we're not like this anymore and, you know, poor us, this reputation, this has kind of dogged us for, for a long time, how that sounds like it's excuse making. Exactly. And I, I, that I, I kind of talked about that a little bit yeah. earlier about the, the, the complaint that I usually get when I bring up the fact that we don't have that. I don't want this to be excuse making. I'm not saying that we don't have a problem anymore. I'm saying that we're not the home of the Klan and we've never been the home of the Klan. And we can't have the conversation yeah. about diversity and racism, real racism, until we put that aside. And every time I bring that up, that's when I hear from people say, you're excusing it. You're saying it's not a problem anymore. You're saying that racism Got died. It. And that's not at all what I'm 
-hmm. what I'm saying. I'm trying to separate those two, uh, those two reputations that we have and those two arguments. So what you're saying is, so, um, so what if I hear what you're saying is that we have to know the story correctly. To know, I mean, history is a big, it's a big buzzword right now. Listen, you know, we can't forget our history. You're mm -hmm. saying know the right story so that we can really know how to address this issue, um, the, the issue of racism, and really know how. Right. The I've, I've, gotten in, I've gotten in online arguments with people where they say, there is a Klan in Howell. There is a, and, I, and I'm going, mm -hmm. no, there's it's not. not. True. There's, yeah. you know, can, can, we, can we agree that there's, it's just not, it's a, it's a fact. There's not, mm -hmm. there's not a Klan in Howell. Yes, there is. No, there's not. But we can't have this discussion until we get past that, you know, particular point there. So that, and I, and I know that I come across to a lot of people is that I'm excusing. Right. Uh, our, or saying our reputation is not deserved. Um, or that it's not a problem anymore, and that's not at all what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. You're just saying it's yeah. You're just you're br you're adding. Look, I want the whole I want scope people to know. Okay, when they say yeah. there is a clan, I want them to know the history of. No, here's the history of how that came to be. There was a guy here that was a clansman here. He was an evil man. Mm -hmm. He died 28 years ago. He lived in Cahokia, and this is what he did. He was an evil, evil guy. Mm -hmm. So that's how that's our clan background. That's background. our clan, you know, reputation. So here's another one that says. Um, uh, I'll just read it directly here and see if I can phrase it as a que as a question. Public mem mem memory is a very tricky thing. You can't mm -hmm. just declare something over mm -hmm. because the icon associated with it is dead. Racism still exists despite the Klan not actually being here, mm -hmm. which I think I you, would, you would agree with that, right? So the, the question is, um, um, I guess, Instead of declaring that it's over, is there another response that we can have mm -hmm. that is more um, effective in this? You know what I mean? Yeah, I think it's that this is what our conversation needs to be now. Our conversation isn't about the Klan. Mm -hmm. Our conversation is about what, what do we want to be as a community? Yeah. And how can we move forward as a community? How mm -hmm. can we address the incidents that come up mm -hmm. as a community? Mm -hmm. So um, one thing. Oh, Sherry's got a question. Sherry. Let me ask this first, and I just want to, I'm just wondering about this metaphor. I know that in some family systems, there are, um, we all have like, a, like an uncle or a relative that we, or maybe even someone in our past, that we just don't, we don't want to talk about. I can about. see where this is going. You know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> and we just kind of put them in the back, or like, oh, that's Uncle Joe, or that's Uncle Herbert, or, <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. And we don't, really, we don't really talk about him very much. And he's almost like the family secret. Do you feel like Bob Miles is a little bit like that? He's kind of like this, 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 this family member that we just don't like to talk about, and we kind of push him in the background. Absolutely. Okay. And that's where I don't know if I've ever done the right thing in the last 35 yeah. years or so on that. Because there's a lot of people who think that he should have stayed in the closet. He should have stayed in the background. We shouldn't talk about him. We should never bring him up before. Uh, we used to never bring him up again. Um, and there are other people like me who think that we need to know the truth in order to face our, face our history. We can't ignore our history. Yeah. We can't ignore that. So it's more, it's more healthy for us to, it's more healthy for us to say as a community, this is a part of our story. Mm -hmm. We can't, we can't distance ourselves from it. This is us. Mm -hmm. This is, this is, um, we can't, we can't push it away and, um, and hide it. He is, he is a part of our history. And know the facts. And know the facts. These, know. Are, mm -hmm. these are the facts. Don't assume you know the facts. Yeah. Know the facts. And then we can have that. Because there, there's opinion and interpretation, and then there's fact. Yeah. The whole thing about the Klan and who Bob Miles was and when he died and all that, that's a fact. Um, it's how, how we interpret yeah. it and how we, how we view ourselves as a community. That's where your you know, personal opinion and your mm -hmm. personal experience comes into play. Yeah. Um, so I guess I'm just trying to separate those two. Okay. Mm -hmm. sure. and, and again, I don't know if I'm doing, I, I'm, I'm curious to know what other people think, because yeah. I don't know if this has been the right approach for the last 35 years or not. Go ahead, Cherie. Good evening. I'm just listening to all of this with black skin. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I'm just itching to talk. Um, <laughs> So 
I, was, I just sat down and wrote three points. Um, first thing, we need to face the facts. I need you to admit, Sherry did not voluntarily get here. Mm -hmm. Okay? Sherry, Sherry's grand, great-grandparents, have a have a fire, it goes back, were mind their own business in Africa. And I probably would have been much better in Africa wearing beautiful clothes and going on about my business, okay? So we need to face the facts that my people were brought here involuntarily. Mm -hmm. So when you get mad when you see a black person, what are they doing here? Talk to your great, go back and talk to them because we didn't ask to come here. Now, you can't get an attitude and say, go back to Africa because guess what? They don't like us either. I went to an African store the other day. They was just, they look down on us, believe it or not. They look down on us because they say, well, you were slaves. Mm. Then some of them are jealous because they think we're doing better than them. So that's a whole nother issue. It's just not pack up and go to Africa. That's, mm -hmm. that's not mm -hmm. even fair mm -hmm. to say, okay? So we need to first take responsibility for why we are in this situation to mm -hmm. begin with. Racism goes all the way back to Moses and Sarah with Mary and Aaron. They didn't like Sarah because she was black. You're not going to ever end racism. That, that's just, that's been here since the beginning. And those of us who are in this skin, we have accepted it. Now, I hear what you're saying. We shouldn't think twice about going to, yes, I should think twice. Like, now I need to be on 96, you know. And it's not just how, Brighton, whatever. I'm in Wayne County, but I know when I go to Canton, mm. there's a difference, and I have to address it. I, I would have liked to have brought a friend with me, but I don't want to get pulled over because he's a tall black guy, but this is the reality. So I think the second thing is, after you face the facts, face your fear. When you see a black person, you don't, you're not seeing an animal. Don't be scared, you know. Most of the time, we're not even paying you any attention. When you see most of the videos, we're being stopped and asked, well, what are you doing here, blah, blah, blah. We're not even thinking about, nobody is trying to harm. 98% black people not thinking anything bad, not trying to do anything bad, just want to go to the, to the mall, just want to do whatever, you know. Um, but then the last thing is be fair. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times, because we have lack of resources, because there's poverty, just like your great, great, great people came over here for a better opportunity, you think we don't want better opportunities? If our schools were the same as your schools, we would stay at our schools. We wouldn't even be mm -hmm. trying to go to, to Kent. Our mm -hmm. friends that moved to Kent because of the education for their children. Mm -hmm. If DPS was the same as Canton Public Schools, do you really think we would be taking 45 minute drives mm -hmm. away mm -hmm. from our family? No, we wouldn't. We played a lottery probably more than the rest of the, the counties. But where is our share of money? Right now, we got kids who need laptops because schools mm -hmm. are gonna be closed. Mm -hmm. Everybody doesn't have the same resources. So I think one thing is if you want to talk about change, don't talk about it amongst each other because you don't know what we need until you talk to us. I could tell you one thing you could do, Chilson Church or how, whatever you want to say. Let's get a group together. Let's pick a neighborhood. Maybe we're going to paint or cut some grass or come to Detroit to see what we need. We, more than racism, and systemic racism is the lack of resources mm -hmm. and the poverty, mm -hmm. which we work hard. Again, last time I was here, we may work at the same place you work at, $15 an hour, but Sherry pays $300 a month for car insurance. If I lived here, it might be 
$80. I'm, I'm telling you what my friends have paid just going to Canton. Half. We're trying to do, we're trying to maintain, but we can't. $300 a week is like, for some people, their whole, a whole check for them, you know? And the resources are not the same. It's not fair. And then there have been times when we did get our own community. Here come the KKK, bombing it, starting trouble, or they pull stuff from us. So until it gets fair, you're going to have this problem because, again, the only reason we even go out of our area is because you're looking for something better. Mm -hmm. And and I'm about to shut up. The, the, um, <laughs> what's the lady, Dr. Um, the, the lady that does that experiment, brown eyes, blue eyes. When she did that experiment mm -hmm. with the mm -hmm. kids the, back in the day, mm -hmm. she asked the kids, how did it make you feel? The one of the little boys said, it makes you feel down, like you don't even want to try. Mm -hmm. we, we feel like we over here playing a red game of Monopoly. Y'all got all the, you got all the land, you got all of the, you got, you know, we, we get a house, you, you, you don't appraise it fair. You know, they just did an article about an um, uh, uh, interracial couple. The wife is black, the husband is white. They got one appraisal that thought, they thought was really off. She disappeared for the next appraisal, took all the pictures down, went up 40%. This is what we deal with. This is what we deal with. Constantly getting, not physically just the, the, in our neck, we're constantly held down. And it's not because we're not smart, it's not because we're not intelligent, but people already sum you up. Even when sometimes by people who you have more than. But because I'm black, it's a problem. And, and to be a black man, that's a whole nother <laughs> episode, you know. But the thing is, I think if you all reach out, and it could be something small, like I said, it's kids that they, the, the laptops is issued, issue, the Wi-Fi is an issue, you know. I saw some kids were sitting out of a Taco Bell trying to get the Wi-Fi access, access so they can go to their class. Mm. We need, if you got the power, hey, get on the phone, call AT&T, we need free Wi-Fi access for this, that, and the other. Because at the end of the day, we don't have the power. We don't. And every time we try to get ahead, it's something happens. But I will say this, and I'm going to sit down. Like, I appreciate the fact that you all are saying, maybe, you know, this isn't, this isn't right. You know, and it's not. And it, it's, it's gone on a long Mm -hmm. This is the same conversation. Grandpa couldn't go there. Daddy couldn't go there. And now my parents is telling me to be careful. And yes, when I get off the freeway, I do think twice. But I do know to say, I go to Chilson and pastor, it, DJ is my pastor. I know that much. <laughs> I already have my story if I get pulled over. But I do want to say thank you for having this conversation. And just at the end of the day, it's all about God. Until we love, love cancels out fear. Let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. And when you love, you won't look at people different. You won't treat people different. So at the end of the day, I guess it's really about us as Christians. What are we doing? Let our light so shine before men that Christ will bring about the difference. Thank God. Amen. <laughs> Once again, we have to follow Sherry Jackson Caldwell. <laughs> <laughs> Not easy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
I, I do, I, there, I want to make sure that I, uh, and uh, gosh, she brought up so many different issues. And one of those that just had, I felt like had to, because she mentioned, she referenced, you know, not wanting to bring her friend here. Mm -hmm. So the question has to do, came really actually online really, was, um, you know, how can we prevent incidents from happening in the first place? You know, um, so now, you've spoken largely as a journalist. Your journalist hat's been on. But if you were to kind of just, but you, you know, you've, you know, kind of just, this is your, this is Buddy, your opinion here. What would be your, how would we, how could we present, prevent those the incidents, either like those or really actually like the incident really with, with, the, with Bob Miles too. So really two separate things. How could we prevent? Yeah. Bob Miles. How can we prevent Bob Miles in the future? And then I want to talk, and then I want to deal directly with what Sherry is talking about too, but. Well, you know, I'm a, I'm a poor sinner and a man of faith uh, like that, so I, I believe a lot of what Sherry said about, you know, if you open your heart up to, to God, then that's certainly the place to start. Um, Bob Miles was a false Christian. He was a bad person, a bad man. The fact that he presented himself as a, as a pastor is offensive. Um, so I, I, I don't know what the answer is beyond you need to put it in people's heart to do the right thing and, uh, and mm -hmm. to see people the way they need to see people. And whatever that, whatever that takes is what needs to happen. And I'm not a smart enough person to know what that, yeah. what that would entail. Yeah. But you, you have to, if you're in a position of power, position of authority, you need to have it in your heart that you're going to do the right thing, not the wrong thing mm -hmm. when, uh, when the time comes. Yeah. Mm hmm Another one? I was gonna say I was gonna say I I, I like the fact that um, Sherry used the word privilege, mm -hmm. and I think that is something that we really struggle with as white individuals um, to acknowledge that we have privilege, but we do, and we can use that privilege to help or to hurt, mm -hmm. and that privilege to help is using the privilege, using the power, using the position of that person to call out when we see it, to, to, to say something. And what happens before that is education. I mean, I go back to my, my role in, in social work for the last 20 years has been focused on education and now social change. And, and we can't do better until we know better. Now, there are some people that once they know better, they still can't do better. <laughs> and, and so those we have to kind of leave in the back and say, okay, you stay where you are. I'm moving forward on this journey with or without you. Um, and we do better. And when we, and we get brave, we get courageous, we get vulnerable to put ourselves in those positions. Um, and as Buddy said, you know, you, you shouldn't have to think twice, but we know you do. We know that people do think twice. And it, I think the thing is we, we think you shouldn't have to, so how do we fix that, right? Um, and it is just, it's that education, it's that communication, it's that conversation over and over again about calling out when we see it and, and fixing, righting the wrongs and acknowledging when we've been wrong. And that's also really, really hard for most people. Mm, yeah. <laughs> I've made a mistake. I need to learn how do I remedy it? How do I move forward? Yeah, one, one thing that, that stood out to me was you were talking about the history was, and I, I wanted to get clarification. Do you feel like there was a, like I feel like I heard there was the really strong reaction to the burning cross picture being up there. But by and large, what was the response of people, residents of Livingston County to what was going on during that time. What was their response? How would you characterize it? Exactly like you were talking about the uncle that you don't want to talk about. Uh -huh. That's what the response was at that time. Why are we talking about this guy? This is one lunatic mm -hmm. nut. Let's, we do not, he's not us. We do not mm -hmm. want to talk about mm -hmm. him. We want to ignore everything that he is. Let's ignore him. Let's ignore everything he stands yeah. for and go on about our business. That was the, the overwhelming response that we got at that time. So what would, have been, what would have been a different response that would have changed the course of history? I know I'm asking, I'm asking mm -hmm. you to be a little bit of a fortune. Well, we, it's very philosophical. You know, yeah, we, yeah. we came to a, 
it happened, whatever that was, three or four years later when the cross was burned on Shirley Griffin's property in, in Livingston 2001 was formed. It kind of took a, a community reckoning. So maybe if that had happened a little bit earlier, it might have it might have helped. something. Yeah, it might have helped. But, but there's still people to this day that thinks that he's our, think he's our crazy uncle and we need to never talk about him mm-hmm. yeah. uh, again. So, um, hey, I don't know. Maybe if, if the conversation had been a little bit different, yeah. if a community had treated him differently in the 70s, that might have helped. If he'd been ostracized in the 70s instead yeah. of being worshipped, I think that that might have helped. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I know that we had talked um, when we were kind of initially thinking about different topics I felt like one thing that I know that uh, well if looking in the Old Testament of the Bible right a big concept in there is the idea of repentance mm-hmm. and in the I mean really throughout the Bible is repentance in which you basically say um, and, and it's it's you see whole communities do this, right? You see whole communities actually say, um, basically acknowledge what has been done and to, you know, like in, in biblical times, they would take, they would change their whole clothes. They would put on sackcloth. They would throw ashes on their head. I mean, they would go full on and they would mm-hmm. say, we mm-hmm. have, we have all messed up. Um, I'm not saying that that would be a pro, that would be something that, you know, our community should do, but I'm wondering what it would be like if, um, because, you know, there's many comments here that have said the leaders need to do something. I'm wondering if it starts with um, us saying, we're really sorry. Mm-hmm. Um, we messed up. And we messed up because we didn't respond in a way that was, um, that indicated outrage. In which we mm-hmm. said, we completely separate ourselves and we say, that is, we, do, we condemn it in the strongest of terms, rather than saying, we wish you would just go away and he'd be quiet. Do you know what I mean? And I'm wondering if we would, if, if, if leaders in the community were to say, we admit that we are residents of Livingston County and we confess the sin of our past and we are wrong for that. We mm-hmm. confess that and what that would do. How did that work in the Old Testament? I, in, in some cases, it led to... Um, it, it led to a cessation, like God's judgment was kind of, you know, was pretty much kind of diverted. It became something different. Uh, we look at what, the story of Jonah, right? The story of Jonah, and he says, you, you know, the city's going to be destroyed. And the people just said, we're done. Okay, we, we, you know, we confess. We've, we've messed up. So I'm just wondering if, mm-hmm. if that would make a difference, if um, part of the way that we keep on kind of keep saying, Listen, the uncle is just, he's just, forget about him. Don't look at him. You know, he's like, pay no attention to the man behind that curtain. You know, if we were to say, this is, we're, this, is, this is a part of our history and we acknowledge it and we are, we are sorry. I guess that's not for me to answer. It's yeah. for the, the people who've been affected, you know, yeah. and I haven't. I'm, a, mm-hmm. I'm at the top of the privilege chain here, yeah. so I'm, I'm not... I'm not really in a, I guess, a position to answer how that would yeah. be perceived. It certainly couldn't hurt. Yeah. Well, buddy, do you, you need anything else? That, that's it? No, you know, I, I think those are all really valid thoughts, and I, I think there's a, there's a direction that we can take that. Yeah. I think there's things we need to learn before we get to that point, and maybe it's, again, conversations with those that are truly feeling that effect. Yeah to say what did what does need to happen yeah um i want to thank sherry too for yeah, yeah. Sherry. sharing yeah. her thoughts and her perspective on there which is something again i in a million years could never never relate to so i really 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 appreciate that thank you mm-hmm. yeah buddy we thank you for being here oh, my for sharing this sharing your story and for for bravely uh covering it back in those days and then that you'd you didn't keep it in the past mm-hmm. that you kept bringing it to our attention, mm-hmm. to our collective attention. And, um, in, again, the big story is like, listen, we can't forget about our past. And there's a lot of talk on, on both sides about that. And I think we, this is important for us to hear it so that we, mm-hmm. um, so that we know and we can acknowledge it and, um, we can confess. And so, um, I think it's really important. And so I appreciate you being here today. So thank you. Yeah. Nicole, yeah thank, thank you. you. My pleasure. Thanks. Sherry. Could you, uh, could you give us the last word? Thank you. 
Again, thank you for having me. I've really enjoyed my time here today. I want to sing a song by Hezekiah Walker. I need you to survive. I need you. You need me. We're all a part of God's body. Stand with me. Agree with me. We're all a part of God's body. It is his will that every need be supplied. You are important to me. I need you to survive. I need you. You need me. We're all a part of God's body. Stand with me. Agree with me. We're all a part of God's body. It is His will that every need be supplied you are important to me i need you to survive you are important to me i need you to survive